Okay, so welcome to the final colloquium of the semester. Hello. And, uh, 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 I miss Mr. seminar. Okay, that's taken care of. So welcome to the final semester of the uh, final colloquium of the semester, and uh, it's a pleasure to have Michael Levin with us today giving uh, this talk. So Michael uh, did his PhD uh, at MIT uh, with Shagan Wen, and then he went on to be a Harvard fellow at uh, Harvard. And then uh, subsequently he uh, became a faculty at University of Maryland where I overlapped uh, for a year with him when I was a postdoc there. And then he is now an associate professor at uh, University of Chicago. So Michael did a lot of amazing things even when he was a graduate student for which he got last year's New Horizon Prize for his contribution to topology and uh, to to understanding of topological system. So today is going to talk about a new world of topology in driven quantum systems. So Michael, let's uh, take over. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the chance to speak here. Uh, it's nice to see some old friends and it's too bad it has to be virtual, but I guess that's just the way it is. Hopefully we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so um, yeah, so today, as my talk suggests, I'm gonna be talking about some kind of interesting new types of topology and topological phases that can appear in driven quantum systems. Um, but before I talk about that, I first need to set the stage a little bit and just remind you about this uh, story of equilibrium, topological phases in non-driven systems, in, in equilibrium systems. Um, so, whoops, this thing is blocking my view of my own slides. So I'm gonna minimize this. Okay, great. So um, I'm not gonna give a, say that much about equilibrium topological phases of matter because it's not the main point of the talk and I could, you could give many, many colloquia on this topic. But let me just remind you that there's been, you know, in the last 40 years, there's been this, uh, that basically people have discovered that there are these many, many different types of so-called topological phases of matter. And these are, Roughly speaking, these are phases of matter where their fundamental properties don't come from symmetry. Symmetry is the usual, uh, the, the usual principle that governs sort of conventional phases of matter, but these, these topological phases, their properties don't come from symmetry, they come from something else which has some kind of topological character. And so there's been a lot of activity trying to understand them and develop tools uh, because you need totally new, new concepts and tools to understand these, these things uh, relative to conventional phases. And I just wanted to, to sort of list here, give you uh, the, the, you know, there's a whole zoo of these types of phases. We have non-interacting phases. These are phases that appear in systems of non-interacting fermions or, or weakly, or systems where interactions aren't important. Uh, the most famous example is the integer quantum Hall states or integer quantum Hall liquids that occur when you have electrons in two dimensions subject to a strong perpendicular magnetic field and uh, cool to low temperatures. And then we have the more recent topological insulators, new types of band insulators, uh, and then the uh, topological superconductors. Um, and then on top of these non-interacting phases, we have uh, some interacting examples, which have even richer properties. They're the fractional quantum Hall liquids, which also appear uh, in two-dimensional electron gases in a strong perpendicular magnetic field. But, but in these systems, the interaction is very important. And then we have so-called spin liquids, which occur in spin systems. Uh, uh, in, and I've listed here the dimensionality to just remind you that these phases can really appear in, in various dimensions and there are uh, many different possibilities. Um, so there's like this really rich world of topological phases of matter. Um, but, you know, uh, there, there's also been a lot of progress in kind of understanding what phases matter there are out there and kind of unifying them together uh, and uh, developing general tools for them. So although this field is still extremely active and there's much more to do here, it's natural to ask kind of uh, at this point, you know, what else is out there? Are there new, is this kind of the general landscape of what can happen in terms of these topological phases or is there something, is there more out there? And of course the point of this talk is that there is more out there. And in particular, one place where this, where new, very, where new phenomena shows up is when you leave equilibrium behind. All of these phases occur in, in thermal equilibrium, uh, usually at very low temperatures. Uh, but you can ask, what if I consider non-equilibrium systems? In particular, uh, driven systems. 
periodically driven systems. Um, so these systems are often called uh, Floquet systems after Floquet, uh, a mathematician who studied periodically driven sort of differential equations. So actually in this talk, I will use periodically driven system and Floquet system kind of synonymously. So what is it? What, what is the so-called periodically driven or flow case system? This is just uh, uh, some kind of quantum system where the Hamiltonian is, uh, it's not static, it's period, it's time dependent and uh, periodic with some period capital T. Um, and um, uh, so by, by construction, this is not some static equilibrium system we're talking about. Now, there are many uh, ways to realize periodically driven systems, which is part of the reason why people have gotten interested in them in recent years. Uh, one way that's uh, is cold atom systems and optical lattices. You can take the, the, the optical lattice, which traps the atoms, can be modulated in time. So that gives you a kind of a time periodic Hamiltonian. Another example that people have, uh, another realization are solid state systems, where you have um, some material like uh, some band insulator maybe, but then you're, you're driving it with some kind of light or optical pulse. And that, that, that drive gives you this time periodic Hamiltonian. And there are even analogs in photonic systems and there are other realizations as well. In general, we really, as we gain, gain more and more quantum control, uh, these kinds of uh, periodically driven systems are more and more experimentally accessible. Now, the interesting thing about these systems and the main point of this talk is that uh, they can really exhibit new types of topological phenomena that's really different from what one sees in equilibrium systems. And, um, and that's what I wanna tell you a little bit about. Um, and um, so the basic outline of this talk is, I wanna give you a flavor of, of, of kind of yeah, new types of phenomena that appear in these driven systems, new types of topological phenomena. Um, and I'm going to do, do, there's sort of, uh, there's two parts to this talk. The first part, I'm going to talk about single particle flow case systems, single particle periodically driven systems. So these are really systems where you just have a single particle on a lattice and it can just hop around on a lattice, but the Hamiltonian that's governing it is time periodic. So it's really almost like a single particle quantum mechanics, but with a time periodic Hamiltonian. And interest in and what I'm going to do there is there's a lot of work on single particle flow case systems. But what I'm going to do is just tell you one interesting example of a single particle flow case system that has some kind of interesting topological phenomenon that's different from the equilibrium case. Then what I'm going to do in the second part of the talk is I'm going to talk about many body flow case systems. And these are systems where uh, we're not dealing with a single particle anymore. We're dealing with many, many particles or many, many spins that are all interacting, many, many quantum degrees of freedom that are all interacting and that are, are driven by with some time periodic Hamiltonian. And there I'm going to tell you some general results. We actually, surprisingly, we know pretty general things about these many body systems. We can even, we know kind of what are the, what types of possible phases are out there and uh, we can say pretty systematic things about them. Now, all this talk is going to, I'm going to focus on two dimensional systems. Um, and, uh, and I should emphasize uh, it, that I'm not going to tell you, I'm only telling you a small slice of, of the work on flow case systems. It's kind of one story that's, uh, that I've been involved in, but there's a lot more work on these systems uh, out there. Okay, so let me start with this single particle uh, example, which is, uh, I think, a really nice introduction to, the, to what the topology of flow case systems. So this example, um, it's uh, it, what it what is it? So it's we're we're dealing with like a square lattice. Each of these black dots forms a square lattice, and then we have a particle that's hopping on this lattice. So and it's just a single particle. So the Hilbert space is the dimension. Of the Hilbert space is just the number of sites. Okay. Now uh, what we're going to do is we're going to turn on some time periodic Hamiltonian, uh, which is going to cause the particle to hop around, and then we're going to get some something interesting. So what is this Hamiltonian, the, the interesting example? Well, we basically there are four steps to this um, uh, uh, drive, okay? And, and re remember the period is capital T. So in the first quarter of the period between zero and T over four, what we're gonna do is turn on kind of hopping along these red bonds, okay? So there's gonna be some amplitude for a particle to hop across this red bond. And we're gonna turn on this hopping at just the right strength so that after this, this step is over, um, whoops. 
so that after this step is over, if I had a particle which is sitting, let's say, on this site, I'm going to turn it on just long enough so that when it's over, the particle is, is moves to that site. So you might call it, uh, I don't know, maybe a pi pulse or something. It's just long enough so that particles on those two sites, they switch places, basically. Okay, so particle sitting on one site moves to the other site, but we're only going to do it along these red bonds. Nothing, no other hoppings are turned on during this first step. Okay, now during the next step, I, I'm going to repeat this, but along the green bonds. Again, I'm going to turn on hopping, some, some uh, hopping amplitude along these green bonds. Uh, and again, I'll turn it on just long enough to make particle hop from one end of the green bond to the other end. Then I do it on the blue bonds. And then finally, for the last quarter of the period, I do it on these uh, yellowish, orangish bonds. So, uh, so then let's see what happens when we put all of this together. So what you can see is uh, if you follow what a particle does, um, on the first step, let's say I have a particle, it's this gray uh, circle here. On the first step, uh, it moves over here because uh, the red bond was turned on and then the green bond is turned on, so it moves there. And then the blue bond is turned on, so it moves there. And then these orangish yellowish bonds are turned on. So it moves, it completes a circle, okay? So, and that's true no matter where the particle starts on any lattice site, it always goes back to where it starts. So in the bulk, if you take particles, if you have some large, uh, system or lattice, and you have a particle in the bulk, it just it comes back to where it started. So it's kind of, seems like it's kind of boring, right? It's just coming back to where it starts. Uh, okay, but... Mark, Mike, someone is yeah. asking about the boundary. Is it periodic or not? Uh, very good question. So I've been, I haven't explained what happens at the boundary yet. So now I'm thinking of, let's say, for the moment, I was thinking of an infinite system or a periodic system. Now let's introduce a boundary. And let's think about, that's the next thing I want to do. Let's think of a particle on the boundary. And let's ask, I, I, what happens in the bulk was kind of boring, but let's see what happens on the boundary or on the edge. So this is supposed to be, now I, this top part is really supposed to be an edge. There are no bonds uh, above this, this top edge, okay? So what happens to this particle at the top? Well, the first step, we turn on the red bond, so it moves over. The next step, we turn on the green bonds, but there are no green bonds attached to that point, so it doesn't do anything. Then the third step, we turn on the blue bonds, so it turn, moves over again, and then we turn on the orange bonds, it doesn't do anything. So we can see the net effect on the edge is non-trivial. A particle is actually moving, it's hopping. Um, it's hopping two sites over, but actually it's hopping one unit cell over. If you're, if you're careful, you recognize that this system has kind of a, a uh, the unit cells, you can see that the, this site is kind of equivalent to this site, right? It has a blue bond to the left and a red bond to the right. So this site is equivalent to this site. So they kind of, they, they the unit cell is actually two, uh, two sites apart. So it's moving one, the main thing you should remember is it's moving one unit cell to the right, okay? In the bulk, it does nothing, but in the uh, boundary, it goes to the right, okay? So that's interesting. And it sort of suggests that uh, maybe along this edge, there's some kind of an edge mode. There's some kind of an edge mode here. So let's try to understand that edge mode a little bit more systematically or quantitatively. Um, so to do that, um, there's, there's a really important tool that we often use when we study flow K systems, which is, or periodically driven systems, which is to think about the stroboscopic dynamics. So we ask ourselves, what happens um, over a whole period? So if, uh, in particular, if you start in some state at the beginning at time zero, and I'll call that state psi of zero, um, then eventually you'll evolve into some new state psi of capital T after a full period. This argument here is supposed to be time. And then there's a unitary matrix UF that describes that time evolution. So UF is defined to be the time evolution operator for one period. It, hop, it takes you from time zero to time T, from T to two T and so on. It gives you kind of the stroboscopic dynamics. And this UF has a name, it's called the flow K unitary. Um, okay, and so this flow K unitary tells you everything about the stroboscopic dynamics, uh, how this particle evolves. And, um, you know, and, and it kind of plays a similar role to the Hamiltonian in a sort of static system. Um, and so uh, to understand at least the stroboscopic dynamics, um, it's useful just like a Hamiltonian to diagonalize you want to diagonalize your Hamiltonian, you want to diagonalize your, your, your in this case, your, your flow K unitary. Excuse me, did anybody probe this, this uh, transformation goes from T1, T2, 3T, probe the phenomena with another beam? Uh, so, uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Go back to that previous slide. Yeah. 
uh, probing, uh, you have, that's, that's, that thing is going as being pulsed at 2T, T, 3T, T, 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 right? And it's moving along. What um, probe this and get some information about what's going on to the dynamics of this wave function. You mean, how do I probe it? Is that your question or? Saying, um, did anybody probe it? Can did, anyone probe it? Yeah, did anybody do that? Oh, nobody is, uh, in this system, I'm just talking about unitary dynamics. So it's, there's no measurement that's taking place, if that's what you're asking. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. There's no measurement. Yeah, at the moment, I'm just looking at the unitary dynamics. But yeah, it's an interesting point, which is that if you were to measure it stroboscopically or, you know, yes. again, that would probably change things. Uh, yeah, that would do something. Oh, so yeah. I'm not, yeah. If this, the way I'm thinking about it, it's kind of coherent unitary dynamics right now. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, um, I, actually, throughout this talk, I'm going to be dealing with unitary dynamics w without really measurement. Yeah, go ahead. I, I have a question as well. So when you switch on the red bond, for example, you could hop both to the right or to the left. Right? That's right. So if you're on, you hop to the other side. So it's like a, a it's like a sigma x matrix. So it takes right. spin up to spin down or spin down to spin up. It switches the two sides. Yeah. So so on the edge, you could go both right to the right or to the left in your example. Um, no, um, so, okay. I think your question is maybe what happens if I started on this site? That is correct. Is it, so on, on the, yeah, that's a good, very good question. So let's see what happens if you start on this site. So if on the first bond, first move, you'll go to the right indeed, into the left indeed. But then the next step, you're going to go along the green bond, which goes down. And then you go along the blue bond, which goes over, and then you go along the orange bond and go up. So actually come back to where you started. So actually, yeah, very good question. I should have said this. So this is sort of the sublattice structure. So the points on this other sublattice, they don't move at all. The, the A sublattice, if you like, moves two over, but the B sublattice doesn't move at all. Does that answer okay. your question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, very good question. Thank thanks, thanks for Thank asking. You. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, as I was saying, you know, to understand the dynamics of the system, you want to look at the flow K unitary and diagonalize it, because that's like diagonalizing your Hamiltonian. So you'd like to understand its eigenvalues and its eigenstates. The eigenstates are things called, they're often called flow K eigenstates. These are things that are preserved under the stroboscopic dynamics up to a phase. And then the eigenvalues, well, these things are called quasi-energies. And they're similar to regular energies, uh, like eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. But there's one key difference, which is that uh, they're only defined up to modulo 2 pi over capital T because, because it appears in this exponential, right? So it's only defined. So this is kind of similar to, uh, in a crystal, how momentum is defined by two, you know, modulo 2 pi over the lattice spacing, you know, crystal momentum. So these are kind of like crystal momenta, but for energy. Uh, sometimes people call it the energy Brillouin zone. But anyway, the point is we can get these eigenstates and corresponding quasi energies. Uh, and then we can uh, think of them as a bit like energies and eigenstates for our Hamiltonian. And so just like for a Hamiltonian, you'd want to plot the dispersion relation. You want to plot the energy um, and, and as a function of say momentum or crystal momentum. So that's what we can do here. So Kx is supposed to be the momentum or more precisely the crystal momentum along the x direction parallel to the edge. That's a good quantum number because we have translational symmetry in the x direction. Um, and, um, and so we can plot our quasi energy as a function of Kx and see what we get. And so what do we get? So I've sort of shown the answer. So there's two things to get you get. So one is you get from the bulk, you get this very, what you might think of as a flat band. This is sort of like a band structure. People call this a flow K band structure. And from the bulk dynamics, you get a flat band. Energy is just zero. Why is that? That's because in the bulk, the dynamics was trivial. It was like the identity operator. So that, that energy here is, is just zero. So in the bulk, the, so this, I drew this line is really thick because it's highly degenerate. There are many, many states, like many, many bulk states that all have this quasi energy zero. But then there's like this uh, extra thing you get, which comes from the edge. At the edge, remember the dynamics was non-trivial. And so that ends up, you get this, uh, this, this linear dispersion. One way to understand why you get this, or one quick way to sort of check that this is the right answer, is to recognize that when you take a particle on the edge, it moves with some constant velocity, which is you can, in each time capital T, it moves a distance 2a, if a is the lattice spacing, right? So it's moving at some constant velocity t, 2a over t. So you know that this mode should have a slope, which is exactly constant, and which is equal to 2a over t. Um, 
there's because it's moving at this constant velocity. And so you kind of can from that you can immediately see this has got to be a perfectly linear um, dispersion relation. And uh, so that's sort of a sanity check. That's one way to see that the edge mode is this perfectly linear thing. Now, one thing you might be confused about when you look at this spectrum is you may remember that when you use usual bands in a crystal, uh, everything is periodic in Kx. So you may say, how is it possible that I have a band that sort of starts down here at one end of the Brillouin zone and then ends up here? It needs to be periodic. But the reason it can do that is, again, it's because the quasi-energy energies are only defined up to 2 pi over t. So actually, this point up at the upper right is the same thing as this point. Like pi over t and minus pi over t should be identified. So this is a perfectly allowed uh, spectrum, but it's only allowed in a flow case system. You can only have this kind of um, winding in the energy direction. Um, this is only allowed in a flow case system because the energies are defined modulo 2 pi over t. OK, so we have this thing. Now we're being, we have a quantitative picture. We have a bulk band, if you like, and then we have an edge mode, which is, uh, which is chiral. It uh, has a positive slope everywhere. So it's describing a mode moving to the right. Now, one question you might ask is, okay, is this mode, this mode, is it stable? If I perturb my system, that was a very special system, will it be stable? And this is a key question when everyone thinks about topology or uh, the, the key issue is whether what you're talking about is stable. So let's imagine we took this system and we perturb it a little bit somehow, changing some of those coupling uh, hopping strengths. What would happen? Well, in general, this exact degenerate states, they, the degeneracy would split. So the bulk, if you like, in the bulk, you'd get some kind of slightly non-trivial dynamics, which would lead to some kind of bulk band. So when you project onto Kx, you get some continue, you get some states like this, some kind of, this is supposed to be the bulk continuum. Okay, so that exactly degenerate band at zero gets split. And then likewise, our, my perfectly, uh, my perfectly linear spectra edge mode, of course, it won't no longer have a perfectly linear dispersion. If I perturb it, it'll have some slightly nonlinear dispersion like what I have drawn here. But, but one thing you can see is that no matter what I do, you know, the dispersions may change, but no matter what I do, I'm never going to get rid of this edge mode, right? You know, because if I imagine changing things smoothly, you know, slowly, continuously changing some parameter, this curve here, it can start to get kinks in it, or it can change its curvature, but it can never disappear. And that's because this curve here, it's actually, it has non-trivial topology. It's winding around this energy Brillouin zone here. It's a, and uh, that can't change. The only way you can get rid of this mode is if this, this, this blue area, if the gap closes, if you like, there's kind of an energy gap or a, in, in uh, at say pi in where this white area is, there's a bulk energy gap. There's no states there. But if this blue thing closes, you know, if this point goes all the way up and this one goes all the way down and they meet on the other side and then reopen, then this, you could get rid of this. But short of that happening, this mode is here to stay. So it's a stable phenomenon that has to do with the winding of the mode in this energy direction. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Is there any restriction on the type of disorder you're thinking of? For example, you uh, could have a you could have mm -hmm. a the blue and the red. You could allow for a backscattering randomly, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, do you have any any restrictions in mind? So, okay. So here, when I was drawing this picture, I, for simplicity, I was doing translationally invariant systems, so I could draw a band structure. But your question is about disordered systems, I see. Oh. So here, what, just to no, be clear, I, what I, I was saying—I meant in time. I meant in time when you. Oh, oh. When you're in going time. through the okay. when you're going through the sequence, do you do you introduce randomness in, in that? Or? You could, yeah. It shouldn't matter. Yeah, that's my point. Is that it's just like it's just this almost a geometrical thing, right? You know. Uh, imagine I do anything continuously. As long as I turn on whatever the thing you did, you can kind of turn on, you can imagine interpolating. Imagine whatever the new Hamiltonian is, you can interpolate it to the old one, okay? Then during that interpolation, this picture is gonna change in some smooth way. And then you can ask how in the world could this mode disappear? There's no way it can disappear. It could change its dispersion or it could even get a kink in it, but it can't disappear. The only way it could disappear is if this whole blue area uh, eats up all the white, like, so I can't draw it. It would have to grow and get bigger and bigger and then basically meet on the other side. The gap has to close. Um, uh, that's the only way you can get rid of this, this, this mode. This is, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. 
it's okay. But that's the claim. Yeah, the claim is it's very general. It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, you can't get rid of this mode unless a gap closes. It's kind of similar uh, uh, to in, in equilibrium systems when you have a chiral edge mode, you can't get rid of it unless the gap closes, um, the gap where this mode lives. Here, the gap is this white space. Means can you mess um, with the driving protocol? Yeah, uh, that's basically So let's question. say if you if you kind of miss one quarter of the driving protocol ever often in the lifetime of the evolution. So can such temporal disorders be uh, allowed in your? Oh, you mean you want to, you want to, okay, let me be clear. Yeah. You mean you don't want it to be time periodic anymore? You don't want it Means, to be time uh, periodic? It's largely time periodic, but let's say you kind of uh, weekly skip some uh, quarter steps. Yeah, that's that was my question. Actually. Oh, I see. I see. That's uh, your question. Um, yeah. Uh, that's, let's see. Um, if you break the time periodicity, yeah, I have to think about that. I don't have an answer. So if you're not the top of my head. So if you're not introducing it in time or in space because you want translation invariant, how exactly are you introducing the disorder in? Ah, oh, well, okay. So, 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 okay. So here I was just doing something very simple. I was not asking, I was not introducing disorder at all. I was introducing, I was just saying, change some parameters, keep translational symmetry, keep time periodicity, but change some parameters. I'm saying something uh, just about that. And then now, of course, so first keep, preserve translational symmetry and change the parameters and the mode stays. Okay, now you could ask something harder, add disorder in space, but, but keep the time periodicity. I claim then it would still also hold. I, so as long as you have the time period to see, I think it has to hold. Um, though this picture doesn't show that because this picture is assuming, you know, I'm, I've drawn it with uh, assuming translational symmetry, but uh, it, it would also hold even if you break translational symmetry. You're asking if I break the time periodicity if something goes wrong. Um, I, um, I'd have to think about that. Maybe I can come back to that at the mm -hmm. end or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and what is this gap? What is the excitation? There are no states above. There are no all. states. There are no so states that's at all. That's right. That's yes, what you're that's calling. That's a gap. That's a gap. Yeah. There's no states outside of this blue region, right? Uh, no, no bulk states outside this blue region. Yeah. OK. Thank you. OK. So um, Okay, so so we have this nice chiral edge mode. But now, you know, um, you, the next question you can ask is, uh, what determines where does this edge mode come from? So, um, you know, what, what determines the presence or absence of the edge mode? Or actually, more generally, you can have different numbers of these edge modes, different numbers, winding numbers, they call it. Um, it can wind around the energy bar one zone different numbers of times. The picture I showed you wound once, but it could wind many times. So you could ask, what determines whether you have an edge mode or how many times it winds and so on, how many edge modes you have? Um, and so, okay, the first thing you might guess is, oh, it's the flow K eigenstates, it's the eigenstates of my uh, UF, my flow K unitary. The reason why that's a reasonable guess is that's exactly what happens in static systems. In static systems, for people who are familiar, when you have these chiral edge modes, to tell whether they're there or not, you calculate something called a churn number. And the churn number, it's calculated for a band, just like here, we have a uh, band, um, we have a flow K band, um, and, and it depends on the wave functions in that band, right? It's a, it, so here you would think, okay, we have a band, maybe I can calculate the from the wave functions of that band, I can calculate a churn number or something which will tell me whether or not I have these edge modes. But that's, um, whoops, but that's not true. So the flow K eigenstates do not tell you anything about this edge mode. Um, and maybe one way you can sort of see that is if you look at that sort of the simplest model I wrote down, the, the, the starting point model, there was the dynamics in the bulk was totally trivial. U was equal to one. So these eigenstates, they're just uh, really boring. They have no, their wave function. I mean, it's in some sense, the wave functions, um, there's a huge degeneracy. You can pick any wave function you like and there's no structure at all. Maybe another way of saying that there's no way this could work is because the flow K eigenstates depend on, are determined by the stroboscopic dynamics, okay? But the stroboscopic dynamics in the bulk was totally trivial, it, had, it was just one. So there's no way from that totally trivial dynamics you would ever be able to see there's an edge mode. So, the, so the, this, this, this won't work. So what you have to think about is not the stroboscopic dynamics, but what people call the micro motion, what's happening within a period 
that's where the information about the edge mode is encoded. And in particular, um, you can actually write down a, a sort of nice uh, number. It's called a topological invariant or something. It's an integral you do. I want. It, I wrote it. I made it small because I don't want you to really look at it. It's some. It's a, but it's a nice simple formula you can write down that in terms of this micro motion, it tells you the number of edge modes. Um, the main, as I said, I don't want to emphasize this particular formula. The main point I want to make is that the edge modes are, are not determined by the eigenstates the way, are in a, the way they are in a static system. They're not determined by wave functions. They're determined by this by something dynamical, about, by the motion within a, um, a micro motion, within a single period. And so this is really different from chiral edge modes in static systems. Although the edge mode itself is somehow similar, the origin of the edge mode and how you predict whether it exists or not is, is different. It comes from this unitary time evolution. It doesn't come from, you can't see it from eigenstates. Okay, so this is supposed to be the first example of how flow case systems can give you something that's really different from a, a static system. It, it can give you something like an edge mode, but edge mode, there's, if you like, there's no churn number. The churn numbers are all zero in this example. It's coming from something different. It's coming from this micro motion. It's not coming from wave functions. Okay, so that's the, the, um, the sort of the first part of my talk. I'm just giving you a taste of how in single particle systems, there's really some new uh, physics and flow case systems. And people have generalized this to many other examples, uh, but that's, I won't go into that here. There are many examples uh, actually for every symmetry class, basically almost every symmetry class where flow case systems have something that's, uh, they have something that's, um, uh, they have modes, edge modes, but their origin, the edge mode is somehow different from in a, um, a static system. So sorry to, I know you don't, can I interrupt one minute, sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you give, tell, explain a little bit more how you arrived at this formula? Is it, how is it related to an invariant you would write in 3D? Is it, is that, the, was that the starting intuition for this? Or? That was not, yeah, no, we didn't get it from 3D. We just guessed it because uh, we knew it had to depend on the micro motion and uh, there was just, there's really only one formula, nat natural formula to write down. We, we knew it had to depend, this is a unitary as a function of time. And so just mathematically, there's sort of a natural num number, winding number one can define in terms of unitaries. So we just wrote it down and then we check, we prove that it works. But uh, no, there wasn't a simple way to understand this in terms of, well, that I know of, to understand this really from 3D, even from th for 3D static systems. Maybe there is a way, but that's not how I understood it or, or do understand it. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the detail of the formula maybe isn't this crucial thing, though it's nice, but it's really that it's, uh, and it's the micro motion, which is almost like the cyclotron motion, which is encoding the existence of the edge modes. It's not the wave function or the eigenstates. Okay. Okay, so now what I wanna do is shift to many body systems. And here the, the flow case systems become even more different from the equilibrium case. Um, so the kind of systems uh, that I'm going to be thinking about now is, I, again, it's two dimensions. I'll be thinking about, say, square lattice. But now each lattice site is a D state spin. So the Hilbert space dimension is D to the N, where N is the number of sites. It's much bigger Hilbert space. And, um, and I'm going to be dealing with you know, general interactions, interacting systems. So I'm assuming the interactions are local, but not much more than that. And now, you know, you can, of course, do the same flow K formalism where you think about the stroboscopic dynamics of your system, what happens every period, um, and you can define a flow K unitary that takes you from time zero to time T. I've made these size capital psi to emphasize that these wave functions are many body states. These are not single particle states anymore. So we have some many body state that's being evolved in time and UF is a many body unitary, very complicated object in general. Okay, so now, you know, this is all well and good, but as soon as you start thinking about many body systems, you run into a problem, uh, which you might call the problem of heating. And the problem is basically, if you have some generic unitary uh, dynamics, interacting dynamics, in general, you expect in a generic interacting system that you're gonna get thermalization. So you're gonna get some kind of um, equilibration to some, um, maximum entropy state. And in particular, in this case, because we don't have any conserved energy, I mean, normally you would get equilibrium, you would thermalize to some Boltzmann distribution or Gibbs state. 
But here, since we don't have conserved energy, basically all states are accessible. And so what you expect is it will eventually go to an equal, basically go into what we call an infinite temperature state. It will be kind of, a, the probability distribution will be, it will be equally likely to be in any state at any energy. So this infinite temperature state is a really boring state. It's an equal mixture of all possible states. And so it means that if for a generic system at late times, any, any, any observable you look at is gonna look pretty boring. Um, so it's, this is not interesting. And, so, and uh, so once you turn on interactions, you have this problem. So now, um, how do you get around Sorry, the, the U of T that you discussed in the bulk was just identity, right? That's right. So that would not have this problem. So I'm talking about a generic. Yeah. In fact, I'll come back to that. But, okay. but for a generic, generic system, you will, you will have this problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. So then how do you get around this problem? So to get around this problem, one way to get around it uh, is to uh, restrict to systems with a special kind of dynamics. So you can restrict to systems which are uh, where the UF, the, the stroboscopic dynamics are, are not generic. Rather, they're of this form where they're a product of URs. URs are supposed to be unitaries, local unitaries, supported in just some small little region. Uh, and importantly, these URs are all supposed to commute with each other. So when you have a UF that's of this form, this special form, uh, then you can easily see that it won't, uh, it doesn't generate interest, you know, it doesn't, uh, in particular, it doesn't generate transport or anything, and it won't thermalize. Now, these systems, systems which obey this are, are usually often called many body localized systems. There's, um, and as I said, there are systems that have no transport and no thermalization. And so it, basically by thinking about these kinds of systems that obey this condition, we can avoid this uh, infinite, this heat, heat, infinite heating depth, infinite temperature sort of heat depth. Um, now, of course, in general, many body localized systems occur in systems where you have some disorder and the disorder uh, can lead to some, uh, or it's at least been argued that in interacting systems with sufficient disorder, you can get some localized state without any transport or, and that the unitaries would obey something like this. But for my purposes, I won't care exactly what, where, what the origin is of how we get to a system like this. Uh, I'll just assume that we have a system with the UF has this form and then see what, uh, what, what happens. So whether it comes from disorder or it comes from fine tuning, it doesn't matter so much from my perspective. So now um, this is interesting. So we're gonna restrict to systems that obey this condition. And I should say this is analogous to restricting to systems that have an energy gap in the equilibrium case. In that, whenever you study topological phases in equilibrium, you study systems with an energy cap. But here we're gonna study as systems that are many body localized, where UF is many body localized. Now, once we, we do that, it, we can also define a notion of a phase in a flow case system, which, uh, how do you define a phase in a, in a periodically driven system? So the way we're gonna define a phase is as follows. We'll say that two systems, if you have two systems, HA and HB, they belong to the same phase if the edge between them can be many body localized. Okay, so you take the two systems, put them next to each other, and you ask, do, is it possible? Is there, any, is there any choice of interactions near the edge such that the whole system is many body localized? Okay. Um, and this is a little bit analogous to in an equilibrium system saying two say insulators belong to the same phase if the boundary between them can be gapped by some you know, interactions or disorder. Here we're saying two flow case systems belong to the same phase if the boundary between them can be many body localized. Okay, so this is a definition. That I should say there are other definitions of phases people have proposed that are slightly different, though they're all somewhat related. But this is the definition I will use here. Um, it's a very physical definition because it means you can tell when two things are in different phases that has a physical signature that there's something on the boundary. Okay, so now, uh, whoops. So now we can ask, um, we can think about, we can now ask questions about different phases. So there's always kind of a trivial phase. This is like the H equals zero. It's like no dynamics at all. Okay, that's tr what we might call the trivial phase. But you can ask, are there any non-trivial phases? Um, and interestingly, the answer is yes, there are. And sort of the simplest case it occurs in two dimensions without symmetry, okay? And it was discovered by these, these people here. And I'm now gonna explain to you a little bit what this example is, a non-trivial phase in two dimensions. And uh, interestingly, this example uh, is very similar to the single particle example I just explained to you. So that's why I've 
uh, organize the talk this way. And so, so what is this example? So this is now a many body system. So each of these dots here is supposed to be a spin with let's say D states. And we're, again, we're gonna turn on, I'm gonna tell you some particular flow case system. And I'm gonna argue it's a non-trivial phase. So what is this system? So it's uh, and the first time, first quarter period, I turn on uh, what I, well, um, some interaction between these two spins. And, and for you can choose an interaction so that the net effect after the, this uh, period is over is to swap the two sites. In other words, in any, any state on the left, the states of the spins are swapped. So another way to say it is the operators are swapped if you're thinking in the Heisenberg picture. So there's, it, it, it just switches two sites, okay? So I can do that if I turn on an appropriate interaction. And it's somewhat analogous to that turning on this, that hop, that pi pulse in the, in the single particle case. Okay, and now I'll do that on the, um, on the green bonds, and then I'll do it on the blue bonds, and then I'll do it on the orange bonds. And, uh, and then we can see what happens. And just as before, uh, in the bulk, if I sort of follow, for example, a spin operator, if I think in the Heisenberg picture, I can follow how an operator transforms under this unitary evolution. And under four steps, an operator on this site just moves around like this. It comes back to where it starts. So operators in the bulk come back to themselves. In other words, the evolution in the bulk is trivial. But if I follow an operator, spin operator, let's say on the edge, it's Heisenberg evolution, it, it shifts to the right. So we can see in the bulk, UF is one, but in the edge, it's a translation. Okay, so it's very similar to the single particle case, but now we're thinking the many body language. Okay, so uh, now what's interesting about this? So again, the edge, there's something interesting at the edge. And what the, what's interesting at the edge is the following thing. A, think about this translation. We usually think of translations as kind of a boring operation, but it's actually quite interesting operation. So in particular, a 1D translation that you can show it cannot be generated by any local 1D Hamiltonian. There's no 1D, strictly 1D Hamiltonian that you can define such that its time evolution will give you a translation, okay? Um, on the right here, I've written some generic 1D Hamiltonian, and this is supposed to be the time ordering. This is supposed to be described some at time evolution of a strictly 1D Hamiltonian. And I should say, um, any unitary that you can get out of a strictly 1D Evolution, we call, there's a name for that. We call that a 1D finite depth local unitary because you can, and that finite depth here refers to the fact that you can get it in some finite time, capital T. So capital T is not supposed to scale with the system size. So no matter how big the system size is, I should be able, a so-called 1D finite depth local unitary can be generated in the same amount of time T. And the claim is that's not true for a translation. So if you want to build a translation from a 1D Hamiltonian, the time it takes to do it actually scales with the system size. You can't generate it in some finite time, in some finite depth local unitary. And that's interesting because we were able to generate this translation from a 2D Hamiltonian, right? In some finite period of time, but only at the back, we could generate at the boundary of that 2D Hamiltonian, but we can't get it in a strictly 1D system. And so we could say that that this edge is anomalous. I mean, it's just a word, but it's kind of, it, what it means is that the, the edge dynamics of the swap circuit are kind of impossible in strictly 1D. You can't bit build it out of a 1D Hamiltonian. It can only be generated in 2D. And that's a hint that this swap circuit, oh, I, I should have said, that's the name of this protocol that I just told you. It's called the swap circuit. Um, I have a great question. Yeah. So if you go, if you if you think about our band structure where you had these bulk states and then you had this uh, chiral edge state, let's say I can mm -hmm. kind of completely localize the bulk states, right? Because you know, there is no invariant That's right. localization. Then you are left with this chiral edge, which is also happy to be living on its own because it's identified to itself yes. through this. Yes. Yes. So, so there is nothing anomalous about, there is no bulk boundary correspondence that I can see. Yeah, if, so that's least, kind of, mm -hmm. at least in yeah, the that, perspective of uh, whether this edge is supported by some bulk states. Exactly. So you've exactly put your finger on why this is a little different from the single particle case. There's no way the single particle case that you can, I sorry, I said single particle, it is different from the static case. And there's no way in a static system that you can get an edge mode just with, with a bulk that's completely trivial and localized. But you can in, in a flow case system, and and that's kind of what I was saying is that in the flow in these uh, flow case system uh, in this uh, 
Floquet systems, the presence of an edge mode is not something you can figure out from the wave functions of the bulk states. You know, they're, they're all localized, they're boring, right? But somehow it, 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 it comes from this uh, motion within this, uh, within one period. So yeah, but you put your finger on the difference. But this fact seems to be kind of going in a different direction, or maybe I don't understand. So the fact you are kind of defining some static-like bulk boundary correspondence, right? That you cannot have a one D lattice translation in a strict local through a local Hamiltonian. So you need some two D to. Uh, so why do you need? Yes. 2D? So I think yeah, that's right. So, so I think what what. Um, Let's see if I try to understand what your question is. Um, I'm trying, yeah, um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how to. There so is, uh, maybe yeah. I, did, I didn't understand this slide. So what you're saying is that uh, you're using 2D bulk system to kind of generate 1D lattice translation in a local right. fashion. But you have not talked anything about the topology of the system, right? Not yet, no. And uh, um, I, if what you're asking, maybe what you're asking is, you might. I could interpret your question asking, how would I uh, be able to predict? How would I be able to see this interesting dynamics at the edge from the bulk, right? So it's yeah. kind of the analog of of what we did in this in a single particle case. I showed you this like formula that predicts it from the micro motion. So you could ask the same question here. If I owe this unitary many body unitary over one cycle, how can I predict that I get a translation on the edge? And that's actually an interesting question my student and I have worked on, and it's a it's highly non-trivial. I could talk to you about it afterwards, but okay. the bulk boundary correspondence in the many body case is very interesting and not fully understood. Okay. But yeah, I'm not going to talk about that here. So here, all I'm going to say is, look, this lat there's something interesting going on the edge. It's the, the, this translation can't be built out of strictly 1D, OK? And so that's kind of some kind of sign there's something interesting there. So what, what, is the what, is, what does it mean? So I'm not, I won't go through the reasoning here, but the fact that it's anomalous, the fact that you can't build it strictly out of 1D, you can use that to prove, at least using my definition of what many body localized means, you can prove that it cannot be many body localized. There, um, and that was pointed out in this paper. So it has a very, and this is a little bit analogous to the fact that when you have chiral edge modes, people uh, know that you know you, you disorder can't localize them. It's somehow it's somewhat analogous to that, but it's also a little different. But it so seems to be self that, sorry. Uh, so it seems to be defeating the purpose in the sense that if the edge cannot be many body localized, it can cause the heat death, right? That's true. It's true, but I guess you know that would take some. It depends on maybe the size of your. I don't know. I think people have investigated that, uh, but it can take a long time for that to happen. So yeah, you're right. So okay. you would have to. Uh, you couldn't study the system indefinitely if it has an edge. Yeah. Okay. It'll eventually thermalize. The whole system will thermalize because of the edge. But I think that could take a long time. So in the meantime, you could see this interesting edge dynamics. Anyway. Um, so what does this tell us? Well, according to our definition, it tells us that this swap circuit belongs to a non-trivial phase. So we found a non-trivial many-body floquet phase. So, okay, so that's great. But then the next question you can ask is, uh, what other phases are possible? Like, is that the only phase? And um, yeah, what else is out there? Uh, many-body phases. And um, amazingly, we can actually answer this question uh, pretty much completely, at least with our definitions. So. How do you understand whether phases are out there? So basically, we're going to use this, uh, what I, we can call the bulk edge correspondence. Uh, so what, what is the idea? It's basically, uh, given any 2D flow K system with some Hamiltonian H of T, we can define its edge. We can ex define a 1D unitary that describes the dynamics at the edge. In the case of the um, swap circuit, I told you know this U edge was just a translation. But for more general systems, you can. there's a way to define this. I'm not explaining exactly, but there's a way to separate out the 1D edge from the bulk dynamics. And so for any, any 2D system, as long as it obeys its many body localized in the bulk, um, I can define this, 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 this U edge. Okay, so I have this mapping between flow day systems and 2D flow case systems and 1D edge dynamics. 
And now what's cool is this mapping, you can use this mapping to kind of classify all the different phases. So it turns out that you can classify the phases by just classifying the possible things that happen at the edge. So again, I won't explain the, the details of how this works, but you can prove that the classification of 2D phases is equivalent to classifying kind of anomalous dynamics at the edge. So you have to find what are all the kinds of anomalous unitaries at the edge. So what is an anomalous unitary? Well, let me tell you briefly what it is. It's mathematically, it's, it's this kind of classification problem. So you, you wanna study a certain class of unitaries which are called locality preserving unitaries and then modulo something called finite depth local unitaries. So let me explain what these two words mean. So what is a locality preserving unitary? It's just a unitary that takes local operators to local operators. So if I have some operator O that's localized somewhere on the edge, this U, uh, it, when you conjugate by U, it's still local and it's still supported near the original operator. So that's what we call locality preserving unitary. A translation is a locality preserving unitary. Now, what is a finite depth local unitary? This is something that's, that's the, I've already explained what it was. It's something that you can generate from a strictly 1D Hamiltonian. So you can think of this as locality preserving unitaries, and this is kind of locally generated unitaries or something like that. So it, in general, these two, the translation is an example of something that's locality preserving, but it's not a finite depth local unitaries. In general, you can ask sort of what are all the locality preserving unitaries that are not finite depth local unitaries? Or more precisely, you can do this, this set modulo this set. That's the mathematical classification problem. And, it's, and, um, and that's equivalent, that problem is equivalent to classifying these phases by this kind of bulk edge correspondence. So this kind of problem of how do you classify locality preserving unitaries or anomalous unitaries uh, has been solved by some mathematical, uh, by this mathematical physics paper, a beautiful paper. And it turns out, so it's a really beautiful answer. There, the anomalous unitaries are in one-to-one -one correspondence with positive rational numbers, P over Q. So there's a one, every anomalous unitary, every anomalous edge is corresponds to a rational number and vice versa. And what is this P over Q physically? So roughly speaking, and maybe you'll see this in an example, this rational number, it tells you about some kind of flow in you. Like in a translation, there's some notion of something flowing. And what is the flow? It's fl what's flowing and it's, a, it, we don't have any symmetry. So it's not flow of charge or anything like that. It's flow of quantum information, or at least that's the, the word, the rough idea. So anyway, <clears throat> what do we get out of this result? So now we have a complete classification of, of, of these 1D edge dynamics. And then, as I told you, that gives you a complete classification of 2D phases. So what we conclude is we have a complete classification of all possible 2D phases without symmetry, and they're classified by rational numbers. So that's an interesting result. And again, very different from the uh, static case where there's nothing like that, where you like interacting phases are classified completely by rational numbers. There's no analog to this. So let me just try to explain to you what this rational number is so you get some sense <clears throat> just with an example. Um, so let me just give you, I think it's, it's conveyed by just thinking about one example. It sounds very weird to associate a rational number to a unitary, but it's very natural. So let me give you a unitary that corresponds to two thirds. So <clears throat> this unitary, this 1D unitary, which has a, a flow of two thirds, one way to define it is to take a spin chain with with six dimensional spins. And then what do you do? You take your six dimensional spin and a six dimensional spin can be written as a tensor product of two and three. You can think of it as a composite of a two and a three dimensional spin. So I can think of my spin chain as being composed out of two spin chains, one with two state spins and one with three state spins. And then the unitary that corresponds to two thirds, what is it? It's just a translation on these two separate pieces. So on the two dimensional spin chain, I translate to the right and on the three-dimensional spin chain, I translate to the left. So that's an example of a unitary that corresponds to two-thirds. And this generalizes. So if you want to know what's a unitary corresponding to P over Q, you could do the same thing. You take P state spins, translate them to the right, and Q state spins and translate them to the left. So what this classification is saying is that basically that's it. All the types of dynamics, anomalous unitaries you can have, they're all built out of what we might call generalized translations, where you take your state, your spins, maybe you split them into kind of pieces and then you translate one piece in one direction, one piece in the other direction. That's the only possible thing you can have at the edge. Sorry, can I ask a quick question before I get lost? Mm -hmm. So um, 
So the challenge here wouldn't it be constructing the 2D uh, driving that will give an effective 1D um, model like the one you just showed? How do you get the 2D one? Is that what you're yeah, asking? Yeah, because you're saying, yeah. Up, uh, uh, yeah. That's what you yeah, said. so that was the next thing I was going to say. So how do you get a 2D one that does this? So again, it's basically the swap circuit all over again. You, you take a, a, you have a, a lattice of spins that are all, say, six dimensional. And then you take each six dimensional spin and you think of it as being built out of a two dimensional spin and a three dimensional spin. And then you do a swap circuit on the two dimensional spins and a swap circuit on the three dimensional spins, but you do them with opposite chiralities. Like you do one clockwise and the other counterclockwise. And then at the edge, it will generate exactly this unitary where the two dimensional spins get moved to the right, the three dimensional spins get moved to the left. And then that will, so that will, that's how you will realize this, this phase. So does this answer your question? So that's the- Yes, it does. You, you, but on the other hand, I'm still confused about what you, why the thing you uh, drew here is called anomalous because my, I mean, the way one understands anomaly is that you cannot have this sitting by itself. That's right. Yeah. So but you can. on the other hand, the way you just described it, it looks like it can be sitting by itself. Ah, yeah. So you, you can have it as a unitary, but it can never come about from a Hamiltonian, a local Hamiltonian. There's no local Hamiltonian that would generate this dynamic uh, stroboscopically or over, over, any period, over any period of time T. No local Hamiltonian can generate this. Um, but local Hamiltonians, so maybe that's not obvious, but that's the claim. So. It, it, so if I made these both d equals two, if these were both d equals two, then you could do that with a local Hamiltonian. I could even write one down for you. It's actually, again, it looks a little bit like a swap circuit. If these were both d equals two, you could do it with a local Hamiltonian. But with one, two, and the other three, there's some kind of flow of information from the left to the right, or maybe it's from the right to the left. Uh, you can prove that no local Hamiltonian can do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not obvious, but that's kind of what this these mathematicians proved is that these all these generalized translations, we can call these generalized translations, these are all non-trivial. They can't be built out of local Hamiltonians. And then they, uh, they also prove that's it. Everything else can be. Okay, so yeah, it's non-trivial. I'm skipping a lot of details, but it's a, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful result. And with that result, you then, it gives you the complete answer. This is all there is. So basically all there is, are kind of these kinds of, it's quite interesting, but all there is is these kind of swap circuits, generalized swap circuits, and that those are the all, all possible phases uh, for 2D systems. Okay, now the, I guess I have, I don't know how much time I have, about five minutes, is that right, Sriram, or I, we started? Yeah, you can, you can take uh, between five and 10 minutes. Okay, so, um, so I just wanna briefly then talk about the last part of my talk, which is, um, where so I got involved in the many body stuff, which was thinking about what happens if you add a U1 symmetry and why would we wanna add a U1 symmetry? Uh, this is many body phases with U1 symmetry. There are a lot of reasons. So one reason is it's a physically relevant symmetry. You know, many systems have a conserved particle number or some kind of conserved U1 charge. Another reason is that maybe with U1 symmetry, we might expect to see some clearer physical signatures because uh, we can have currents and things like that. Whereas with systems without symmetry, you can't really talk about a current, a, a current in the traditional sense. And also there's been a, a, quite a bit of nice work on U1 symmetries, but most of it's focused on non-interacting systems. So the problem of understanding U1 floquet phases, interacting floquet phases with U1 symmetry was not really uh, systematically understood. So what we asked was, kind of could we repeat that basically what was done throughout symmetry so what are all possible floquet phases with u1 symmetry um and uh and again amazingly you can kind of give a complete answer to this question uh, so so what is but to explain the answer i just have to i'm going to basically tell you the answer but let me just tell you the setup so the setup is you know because we have a u1 symmetry i have to explain how that uh, the structure of each spin so i'm going to imagine i have spins or finite dimensional Hilbert spaces on each site. And each spin, let's say has D states. And I'm gonna assume that the, each of these states have as different, carries a different charge. So these might be like, it might be just in the simplest case, there might be two states that carry charge zero and charge one, like occupied and unoccupied. But in general, I'm gonna assume, I'm gonna be more general. I'm gonna allow D states with arbitrary charges. Now I will assume that these charges are integers, which you can kind of do without loss of generality. 
And I also assume that the smallest of all the charges is zero. Again, you can sort of do that without loss of generality. But otherwise, they can be anything. And those are the charges on each site, OK? So then, um, now, to explain to you my, the answer for how to, what's the set of phases that are possible, you, there's a, con, a kind of convenient trick, which is, you know, we have this set of charges on each site, but it's nice to kind of summarize those charges with the, as, a, as, a, as a, uh, in a generating function. So I'll take the sum, this formal, Z is a formal parameter here, and I can take this sum of Z to the QI, that's just the charge of the ith state, from I equals one to D. So what is this FQ of Z? So by construction, it's a polynomial because these Qs are all non-negative integers. And, it, and its coefficients are also always non-negative. So it's what we might call a non-negative integer polynomial. It's a polynomial whose coefficients are non-negative integers. Um, now, one other, one other thing that's nice about this FQ of Z is it, it's multiplicative under tensor products. So if I take two spins and I combine them into a bigger spin and I can relate the FQs, they just multiply. You can easily check that. So that's kind of convenient. But anyway, this is just a way to summarize the charges on each site. Now, what, what, what's the result? So we could, we kind of, uh, we want to classify all these possible phases. And again, we can do it by looking at these anomalous unitaries at the edge. And so we tried to, we worked out how to classify these unitaries at the edge. And we found that they are classified not by rational numbers, but by rational functions of some formal parameter Z, whose physical significance I'll explain shortly. So it's just, it's, it, there's a one phase for every rational function where P and Q are non-negative integer polynomials. Okay, so that's a little, uh, so I'll, I'll try to explain what, why, where this comes from in a second, but that uh, means for every phase, we can associate a rational function. And this rational function pi of Z, it tells you about uh, both the information flow in U, but also the charge flow in U, okay? It actually contains both pieces of information. And this result here, again, it gives us a complete classification of all the 2D phases with U1 symmetry, just like in the no symmetry case. There's one phase for every rational function of this kind, okay? So let me now just, again, give you an example so you get some idea for where this, what this P of Z and Q of Z actually mean. So let me just give you an example of a unitary that corresponds to this particular rational function. So how, what, so how do you get a unitary that corresponds to this rational function? So it comes from a four state, you can realize it in a four state spin chain. And each, each spin, I'm gonna assume, has, has four, uh, four states with charges zero, one, two, and three. Okay, so those are the charges, U1 charges on, e of each, of, uh, on each of these uh, black dots. So, in terms of that notation I wrote down, that the FQ would be one plus Z plus Z squared plus Z cubed. Okay, that's just, that just summarizes the charges on each site. But now I told you that you can, uh, under tensor product, these FQs multiply. So conversely, if I wanna factor this site into two pieces, I just have to ask if I can factor this polynomial. And indeed I can, I can factor it into a product of these two polynomials. So what does that mean? That means I can split my four state spin chain into two two state spin chains, one which has this FQ, which means it has charge zero and one, and one that has this FQ, which means it has charge zero and two. Okay, and then once I split it, how do I realize pi of Z? Well, you may have guessed it. It's just the same thing as before. The one spin chain, the one plus Z spin chain, I translate to the right. The one plus Z squared spin chain, I translate to the left. And again, this generalizes. To get any unitary like this, you just take the appropriate spin chains and then translate one to the right and one to the left. And that's, that's it. Um, and again, you can ask how to get the 2D system. It's the like same thing. You take your spins, split them into two, and do swap circuits on each. So again, we kind of get all the possible phases come from these kind of generalized uh, swap circuits. Um, Is it necessary that one should go to the right and one should go to the left? Or um, no, it's not, but this is enough to get all of them. So you, you, could, you can, of course, you could have this one go, say, two to the right, Let's just let's generalize a little bit. Let's suppose this goes m steps to the right, and this goes n steps to the left, where m and n could be uh, any integer, right? Then this would become one plus z to the m over one plus z squared to the n. But yeah, m and n could have any sign you want. So yeah, you could have them both go to the right if you want. I just I think I just did it this way because um, 
well, what's special about this particular example is that if I break the U1 symmetry, it, it's no longer anomalous. Because if I break the U1 symmetry, these are just two dimensional spin chains, one going to the right, one going to the left. So that's why I presented this example, because it's an example of a phase which is trivial in the absence of the symmetry. It's non-triviality comes from the U1 symmetry. So say a killing U1 means setting Z to zero in this case? Z to one, actually. Yeah, okay. killing U1, actually, if you set Z to one, then this pi of Z becomes that rational number that we talked about before. So in this case, you would get two over two, which is one, which would mean one, I didn't tell you that, but having, having a rational number of one is the trivial phase. Uh, so, okay, so yeah. if you have so, two plus Z and three plus Z squared in the denominator, then, uh, so then it still is non-trivial, so, but maybe that is yeah. not factorizable. Yeah. Yeah, no, there are lots of examples you could write like this. I just tried to pick kind of the simplest. No, I was saying, I'm thinking um, that can you have, a, can you write a phase where you break U1 symmetry and it reduces to the previous non-trivial case without oh, U1 Oh, symmetry. you want it to be two thirds. Oh, you want it to be two thirds. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe I could just make this a two plus C squared at the bottom, right? That would do it. So that oh, okay. would just be in, 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 that would just be a spin chain that has three states, two of which have charge zero and one of which has charge two. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to check if U1 symmetry, if you take away it's still the previous non-triviality can yeah. remain. Yeah. yeah, 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 you can have that, yeah. So this can have both, yeah. Okay, so I know I'm almost out of time, but I just want to mention one more thing to just, you know, I didn't tell you what the Zs mean, like physically, it's like a formal variable. It seems like a mathematical trick. So I just want to tell you, this give you some insight into maybe what Z means. So you can ask, can I measure this pi of Z? Like, could I actually measure it? And actually there's kind of a, uh, at least a thought experiment where you could measure it. So how would you measure it? Um, and it gives some insight into what Z means. The way you'd measure it is you take your, your flow case system and define it in annulus, this green annulus, and you start in some initial mixed state. And this initial mixed state is kind of like, uh, you can think of it as having a, a, a spatially dependent chemical potential mu. I mean, I've defined it here, but you can think of it as roughly having some mu r, you can think of it as the chemical potential on site r. And you, you want to consider an initial state where the chemical potential, uh, let's say on the inner edge is mu in, the chemical potential on the outer edge is mu out, and there's some interpolation between them, maybe near this dotted line, okay? It doesn't actually matter in detail how they interpolate, but it's mu n near the inner edge and mu out near the outer edge and interpolates. That's your initial state. And then what you do is that's your initial state. And then you ask, uh, when I time evolve it, you can ask how much current flows around this circle, U1 current, because you have a U1 symmetry, you can define a U1 current. And interestingly, that current that flows, so in particular, you can define what you call the time average current, where you average over many cycles. And you can show that this average current is directly related to pi of z. Uh, I've written it here, but the details don't matter that much. It's, it's related to pi tilde of z, which is, this is the charge part of pi of z. It's the part that doesn't have to do with quantum information. It has to do with the charge flow. And it, it, it tells you, you can completely measure this pi tilde of z, which is sort of the charge part of pi of z uh, from this current. And this tells you kind of what z is. z is related to, physically, it's related to the fugacity of the particles. So pi of z tells you current as a function of chemical potential. Uh, so that's kind of maybe gives you some sense. Z is somehow, pi of Z is telling you cur uh, current as a function of chemical potential, or it's related to that. Anyway, just to summarize, I've told you about some novel single particle flow case systems. I told you how you can surprisingly classify 2D flow case systems pretty much in generality. And I told you that in the U1 symmetric case, you can actually measure these like kind of abstract invariants, at least in principle, in terms of currents. Um, but there's a lot of interesting open questions, like higher dimensions, what happens in 3D, it's pretty not, really not well understood, other symmetries, and so on. So I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks, Michael. Uh, okay, so are there any questions for Michael? Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't understand how you made this, why you are making this distinction between 1D and 2D. If you have 1D, but with higher 
dimensions in at, at each side, you can essentially put all 2D information in 1D system. So what is your, where is your distinction between 1D and 2D? Oh, I see. So you're saying you could build a 2D. <clears throat> um, yeah, I guess I'm saying, um, probably I want to say that uh, you're fi I don't want to allow you to make the dimensions of the sites arbitrarily large. They're fixed at some finite value. So uh, you, can't, you can't simulate a 2D. I think what you're saying is, in principle, any 2D system can be simulated by a 1D system with sufficiently high dimension yeah. or something. Yeah. Uh, but um, the point here is that uh, you're not allowed to um, uh, uh, change the size of that Hilbert space. Or, uh, it, you, know, you just have to keep it fixed. If you keep it some fixed Hilbert space and you ask for some 1D system, can I, can I create a translation out of some local Hamiltonian, um, you, you, you can't do it. Yeah. I see. Okay. Uh, Michael, I have a question. So it seems that I can take any static anomalous dispersion and just uh, exponentiate with an eye in front of the argument. And that means whatever protocol realizes that unitary sort of could be classified as anomalous unitary, right? Um, let's say, for example, in the in the uh, my, what, the example that comes to my mind is that let's say omega equal to v k is the dispersion for the chiral edge, which is not allowed on in one D alone. But I can kind of exponentiate that. Let's say I call it e to the power i v k, uh, and then or and then I can kind of see that there cannot be a local h one D corresponding to that dispersion. Um. Yes. So what I'm saying so is that take an anomalous this... static system and then convert mm -hmm. it into a exponentiate into a exponentiate it with i with an imaginary number in front of it, and that would once you try Fourier transform it back into time domain, it could be your anomalous unitary. Um. Yes. I. So in you're saying. Um, I don't know if you're thinking about the single particle case or the many body case. I mean, let's say I'm, I'm thinking about a single particle case. Maybe it could gen be generalized to many body also, but I, I right. Don't know. So it is true. I don't know if this is what you're saying, but if you take um, like a static system that has edge modes, like a integer quantum Hall state or a churn insulator, and just the you, edge uh, part. Well, if you take the whole system, I mean, I, you know, I think what you're saying will go through. If you take the whole system and you evolve it in time, yeah, there's a nice picture. I, maybe I can draw. Let's see. Uh, how do I draw? Means you can uh, annotate, I think. I know. I, yeah, I should be able to. Let's see. Sorry, one second. Um, oh, it's not letting me do that. Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, pen. So like if you take some system like uh, with two bands like this and like some edge mode connecting them, and this is a static system, right? And now if I exponentiate, if I evolve it in time, if I just take a completely static system and evolve it in time for an appropriate length of time, what happens? So what happens is as I evolve it in time, kind of uh, in the quasi energy space, this thing moves up. Like it, you can, this thing lives on like a circle kind of like this. Yeah, yeah, when exactly. I evolve it in time. And if I evolve it in time enough, this thing can go all the way around the circle and come back yeah. here. And then I'll end up with a picture that looks like this with this mode exactly. kind of going around yeah, the circle, yeah. which is exactly the kind of picture I, I had drawn, right? I had yeah, yeah. a picture like this. Um, yeah. So yeah, you can do that. And that's one way to realize these systems. So you could say, then why is the flow case system different in the single particle case? And indeed, this I think the single particle case is more subtle. There's a very close connection with the, um, with the static case. The, the difference is just where the information is encoded, basically. Like if, if you're given this yeah. information, uh, if you're just given the, the, the eigen, the, the, this band has zero churn number because it comes from, if this had churn number plus one, this had churn number yeah, minus yeah. one, it comes from exactly. putting the two together. Yeah. So it, the, the, it's just a question of where the information is encoded. The information is no longer encoded in the churn number of this flow K eigenstate band. It's mm -hmm. encoded in this uh, 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 micro motion. But indeed, there's a very close relation for single particle systems. It's really for many body systems that the 
uh, flow case systems become totally different. I mean, there's no connection that I know of really in the many. Yeah, but in the in this, uh, you can play this game in higher dimensions also. Take a single Dirac cone, which is a surface of uh, TI, and then play the same game. Like then you get like flow case. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so that's what gives you this hint that basically there's a very close connection. There's a there's a kind of kind of correspondence between the static systems and the flow case systems uh, for single particles. The main difference is in this point about how you compute, how you predict the existence of the edge mode. Right. Like it's, but the but the kind of structure of the edge modes and and classification for different symmetries is classes is pretty similar. Uh, there's a map. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it means you cannot. Uh, so let's say if I keep doing this, play this game from static to floquet, then I won't miss any new floquet phases, in, at least in the single particle case, right? That's correct. Yeah. As far as I know, every single particle floquet phase. Now, it gets a little weird when you put in symmetries like time reversal. I get confused by that, but I don't think that's going to be a problem. I, I, I think, yeah, I think pretty much all of them come from um, time evolution of a static Hamiltonian. You can think of them that way. That's right. right. So in that sense, they're not really that weird. There's just, it's, I think it's, it's, yeah, that's right. But you can do different things with them. Like you can then localize these states, you know, once, once you have it, um, uh, once you take your, if you take your static system, you can't localize all the states in these bands. You can only localize them if you couple them together and to couple right. them together requires breaking the static. You have to introduce some, some yeah. drive at some frequency. Yeah. But you're saying that there is no such analogy for uh, interacting cases because it looks like That's right. the, yeah, okay. As far as I know, the, the closest analogy is a little weird. It would be to static systems with a very special kind of energy spectrum. Like you'd need some special properties of the many body spectrum. I, uh, I could talk more Means can't you use the Lattinger liquid type edge theories and flocate them? <laughs> somewhere um well i think the problem is if you just time evolve some interacting many body system it won't be it won't obey this many body localized condition in general right right okay. um, yeah. so i don't know um yeah it i see tricky. okay yeah, yeah i mean the other the other, the other way the other way you can see that they're different is just what what are you classifying what are you talking about in static systems you're really talking about ground states many body mm. ground states that's what we're talking about in the flow case systems we're talking about unitaries so it's actually right. just a different object. One is classifying sort of low energy degrees of freedom. And the other is talking about the whole unitary. It's the whole right. unitary. I didn't emphasize that, but so that's actually, that's probably the biggest difference. In the many body case, one is a many body unitary you're talking about. And the other is a many body ground state. Um, in a single particle mm -hmm. case, there isn't as much of a distinction, but in the many body case, they're uh, somewhat different. So in that, con in that context, uh, in the static many body case, if you were to yeah. change, tune a parameter through a ground state phase transition, yeah, the, the same systems coupled to the same dynamics that you you introduce in, for the floquet case, you would see different mm -hmm. class, different uh, p over q or pi over z classification with the different static phases. Uh, so let me see if I understand your question. You want to take a static system, and then what do you want to do to it? It's a many-body system, and you it, you fudge it into a flow case system by appropriately introducing some time dependence. Oh, you want to add some driving to it or something? The way you're doing it, for example, the way you're trying to take it. Oh, I see. Like you the mean... conversation you were just having about oh. how do we take a static system and then oh. make so it that I... I think what I the this naive thing I was saying is that you don't add any driving at all. You just you just take a static system and regard it as a flow case system, right? You can do that, right? It's a special kind of flow case system where the Hamiltonian is time independent, right? I think what I was saying was in this in the in the many body case, if I do that, it won't be many body, it won't obey this many body localized condition, right? If I just take a static system, UF That's will right. just be the exponential of some Hamiltonian, it will not be. You know, it won't be many body localized, right? You, so you you wanted that condition. You are you are prior. Yes, right. So that so that's what goes wrong. I mean, th that's why you can't just do that. Now, if I turned on some driving, then I could probably well, to okay. first approximation, I could get anything. But I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure there's yeah, more okay. you could say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
But for the single particle case, you can really just regard the static system as a special kind of floquet, and that's allowed because we didn't have that that condition, mm -hmm. right? And, and then yes. in that case, you really can generate a floquet system from a static system, and this sort of gives you a nice correspondence uh, between mm -hmm. the two. I mean, you can, yeah, you can turn a static system into a floquet system, yeah. Also, uh, just to understand something, you said the pi tilde, which was pi z over pi one, was the yeah. charge, yeah. charge component. Uh, and yeah. then you said, as opposed to the quantum information component, yeah. how can you get that out of pi of z? The quantum information component? Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's just pi of one. So pi of one tells you one this the... rational number. So that tells you this like P over Q. And then um, uh, okay, you can okay. see that. Okay, if you, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah. But the rest of it, the pi over Z divided by pi over one tells you kind of everything else. Oh, it tells you the charge. charge and then, yeah. and when you and when you do this current thought experiment, it it can't measure. So not surprisingly, it can't tell you anything about this because this has nothing to do with charge. It's really about some information flow. Uh, but it can tell you about pi of z divided by pi of one, which is this pi tilde. So that just is like you can you define have a, a just like you can define a current with a u one. Can you define? such a current for the quantum information flow? Really, yeah, that's really interesting. And we thought a lot about that. Um, as, as far as we know, there isn't, because um, there's no like kind of conserved quantity that, well, interesting conserved quantity, at least, that you can define corresponding to, as far as we know. I mean, so I, th I think the short answer is we don't know how to define a current for that. Um, we don't know how to do that. But yeah, that would be really interesting if there was something like that. So what is the meaning uh, of quantum information? Yeah, it's, it's just words, right? Um, yeah. So I mean, I only, t I, I mean, people have written, I could refer you to some papers where people really tried to uh, consider some thought experiments with various particles being entangled and so on. But, but let me just tell you the rough picture for it. Um, the rough picture for it is, um, it's nice to like draw like a cut through your system. <clears throat> and then you have person A who's measuring things to the left of this cut, let's say and person B who's measuring things to the right of the cut. And then you can ask over one period, you know, let's say you have a translation, like the, the simplest case, like you just have a simple translation, okay? Then you can see over one period, B learns about one spin from A. Let's say, say the spin is a two-dimensional spin. Then over one period, B learns about one bit of information. So it learns log two information from A, right? Uh, about the state of A's spin. So if A has some state on the spins to the left of this cut, B gets one bit of information about it um, uh, per period. Um, now, if I have a more general situation where I have like a translation here of, of, of p-dimensional spins, and I have here uh, a tr uh, an opposite translation of q-dimensional spins, then you can see um, sort of B is learning uh, uh, log p information from a um, and a is learning log q information from b and so this flow of quantum information it's roughly defined as the difference between how much b learns about a minus how much a learns about b so it's the difference between these two it's like it's the difference between how much b learns from a and a learns from b and so that difference is log of p over q so actually it isn't p over q that's the quantum information it's it's log of p over q tells you kind of the flow of information from A to B. It's the difference between how much information B learns from A relative to how much information A learns from B. You have to take that difference because otherwise you can just have like just a swap. Like if I just have a swap, which is not like interesting at all, right? That's, you know, A learns something from B and B learns something from A, but you can see in a swap, they learn equal amounts from each other. So there's somehow no net flow of information across that cut. And so that's why, that's how it's defined. Is that give you, does that sort of answer your yeah, question? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting, this information stuff. Yeah. OK, so any more questions for Michael? If there are no more questions, let's thank Michael once more. Thanks. People are mentally thanking you. <laughs> That's fine. I know, I know how these things go. <laughs> I, always feel, I, always feel, I always feel funny on the audience side because like I don't really, I know that there's ways of clapping like 
you know, virtually, but I don't really do it. And so, yeah, it's just weird. It's just like, uh, uh, but anyway. Shiran, there was one talk in which the organizer said, no, let's